Welcome to another edition of Recovery Monday, brought to you by the good folks at Powell CDC. I'm J. Michael McCoy, my co-host Lila Stafford and Bob Montserrat, the cat in the hat. That's right, Bob's back. He's been on training. Then he had to empty his pockets while his son got married. A beautiful wedding, I hear. Yes. You got it right so far. Keep going. I thought I did. Uh, Ryan is producing, and our special guest today is Mark, and uh, Mark is uh, one of us, a 12-stepper, and Mark is here to uh, share with us uh, the story of what his life was like, uh, what happened, and what it's like now. Now, I had somebody the other day compliment, oh, I forgot to tell you this, somebody at church came up and complimented us on the show because um, she assumed that we would be talking to the addicts and to the alcoholics. But in fact, what you and I do is we talk to those support people, those uh, uh, people who are in love or related to the person who has the disease or the sickness, trying to help them understand how to cope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, and she got that. So she thanked us for it. Betty was her name and she appreciated that. Mm. All right, Mark, how are you? Magnificent, Mac. Thank you. Magnificent. I like that word. Perfect. So uh, uh, <laughs> were you uh, alcohol, drugs? What was your uh, vice? Oh, absolutely. Alcohol was uh, was my preference. And when did you first taste alcohol? I think that the age would have been about uh, 17. All right. So in high school? High school. And did you? where did you go to high school at? High school in Fort Dodge, Iowa. Went to a little uh, small parochial high school. Okay. All through grade school as well. And um, yeah, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, Super nice nuns, some some good priests. Well, you don't hear that leadership. very often. Super well, uh, nice nuns. Well, uh, in in fact, I, I have a lot of respect for for just about all of the all of those folks that uh, that I had the the opportunity to yeah. be with. I was the kind of guy who uh, greatly benefited in in going to a small high school. Okay. And um, so for that reason, uh, uh, I was uh, I was really grateful. Did the kids at your high school drink? Uh, you know, uh, now, now I'm going to date myself here, but uh, uh, drinking wasn't uh, certainly as, um, as prevalent uh, then as it is now. It wasn't uh, nearly as acceptable, but in fact, it did exist. Um, Maybe but, at your high school and mine, it was <laughs> huge. <laughs> you know, um, it, it, I think that another thing that played a role with with me not really doing all that much drinking in high school was the fact that I was uh, in a lot of sports yeah. and very active as the the president of the thespian society there in the in the uh, the oh, high school. Cool. So whenever there was a stage performance or a musical or whatever, I was there helping uh, uh, get it ramped up, or I was you know uh, contributed uh, you know as a as a performer. So. Uh, but I will. But I will tell you that the moment that I got out of high school, and um, uh, it, uh, it it began in earnest, and uh, that began uh, or that uh, was the the start of a very long uh, drinking career. How how many years? Well, when you when you take a look at the math, there um, you're talking probably uh, um, you know almost forty years. Wow! Right. So you get out of college, and you go, or I'm sorry, you get out of high school. Do you go to college? I did. Yeah. So, so you're hanging. So it's the party scene. Oh, without a doubt. Where'd you go? Iowa Central Community College, two Hella? year, two year uh, college up in Fort Dodge. Oh. Um, uh, continued in a in a leadership role up there, president of the uh, the concert choir, and very active in the chamber choirs as well. Uh, but uh, playtime was a very big. Uh, big part of what we did there um, uh, immediately following very long rehearsals. It was uh, hit the pubs, have, uh, have a few brews, and, um, you know, just work late and drink late, and then get back up in the morning for, for school. Back and do it again. Okay, this doesn't have anything to do with um, drinking, but do you still do any of that? Do you still, are you in plays, or do you sing now? No, I appreciate that, Lila. Uh, no, I pretty much uh, gave it up. Uh, I've... Uh, uh, through the years, I've sang uh, uh, weddings and uh, done a few uh, duets and trios with uh, friends of mine for gigs, birthday parties, anniversaries, mm -hmm. and things like that. Really a lot of fun. But uh, all in all, it takes a lot of dedication to do that. And um, frankly, I was uh, highly focused as a business owner to um, make sure that just about all of my energies were pointed in that direction yeah. or 
you know, with, with my family. Yeah. Were you a workaholic as well as an alcoholic? I, I would have to say yes. Okay. Because I'm not, sh- I'm not so sure that you can take, you know, the, uh, take the addict out of uh, the work environment. Well, if you and- own your own business, I think... Almost everyone that owns their own business seems yeah. to be. I, ha- I have to agree with that, yeah. Lila. It, uh, you know, the same kinds of uh, characteristics that uh, that moved me to the direction of uh, addiction uh, also played out in the workplace yeah. there. And um, uh, so they, uh, so the, there's a very close relationship uh, mm-hmm. there, I would, I would have to say. So what was your drink of choice? Um... Well, how much time do you have? <laughs> we have an hour. Okay. Well, then let's get started. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, frankly, I, uh, my dad uh, was a, a very strong stage three alcoholic, and his uh, thing was beer. But I do know that uh, as the evening wore on, uh, he was capable of uh, putting down a few shots of just about anything that might be available. Um Early on, I liked beer, but really never really um, had a high tolerance for it in terms of quantity. It was always a great way to get started for the evening, but then I'd get full. Um, So I think that my uh, uh, genetics were more along the lines of my mother, and she was a bourbon gal. (laughs) And so... You know the Crown and uh, Seagram Seven, uh, really. Uh, and Seven, That's really. Seven and Sevens really worked out very well for me for a very long time. Now you used a term that I, I'm sorry, I'm going to be ignorant. I don't know what it means. You said stage three alcoholic. What, what does that mean? I don't know. I've never heard that before. Well, um, uh, I don't know if I can uh, actually define the different stages, but I do know that clinically they. Um, there are uh, uh, schools that uh, that have defined those those stages. Um, addiction, like anything, uh, you can have very um, uh, uh, early stage uh, uh, ad- uh, addiction um, feelings that um, you are in fact emotionally yeah. addicted to a, a a scenario. Bob, can you do you? Are you familiar with that language? It's, no, but I was looking it's it up It's different here. nowadays, but it's even changing as I speak um, in the DSM-5. But it, we have um, now, it, we, we call it abuse or dependence. And abuse is the beginning stages when you, um, your body isn't, doesn't need it. But you, that's what I was. I, I abused alcohol. My body didn't depend on it. I didn't have to have it every day. I just... Um, when I drank, I drank too much and maybe got in trouble a few times. So that's one kind of alcoholic, but then it progresses into dependence where your body, eventually your body needs it, has to have it every day. But that's even changing in the DSM-5. Um, and I'm not sure how it's changing. I just know that mm-hmm. they're going to. But the, it's, it's depending on what year you're talking about, it's, I don't know where. I, I have heard of the stages before, but I'm, I'm not quite sure where stage three would be. Did your yeah. father... Yep. Did his body depend on that every day, or if he went without it, would he get the shakes? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, th- I tend to think that you're exactly right. I think that it, perhaps in the earlier generations, they they labeled it as as uh, different stages. Yes. To where uh, now I am aware that, uh, you know, the DSM manuals and the latest there has to do with um, uh, simply uh, putting a little bit more of a blanket uh, kind of... Um, uh, label on there, um, but yeah, my my father uh, uh, had become highly highly dependent on alcohol very early on. He essentially grew up without a mother, who he lost at age five from cancer, and um, was raised by by aunts, and um, so they felt bad for him. Mm-hmm. So he they so he was a highly enabled yeah. young boy mm-hmm. and man, and. Um, uh, he also lost his father and his only brother by the time he was 20. Uh. So people felt sorry for him. Mm-hmm. And back then, he didn't know the consequences of feeling sorry for himself. So he yeah. used that to his advantage and essentially took a nosedive into a c- case of beer and never emerged. Wow. So How did that affect you and your drinking? I mean, it I'm glad you asked, and I think that's a, an extremely pertinent question. Um, 
uh, it's my understanding, and what I've read is that a, a, a substantial amount of, uh, of, of, of a root cause for addiction is, is shame and, and, and shame issues uh, surrounding those. How it, uh, um, how it manifested out in, in my family was such that it became a highly disenfranchised, um, unfeeling mm -hmm. environment. Mm -hmm. um, there was no emotion, mm -hmm. so it became deeply rigid and uncaring. So the, uh, how we translated that as, as children was that we didn't matter. Ooh, we didn't yeah. matter. And um, how many were there? How many children? Five children, mm -hmm. and out of the five, we have four alcoholics. Mm -hmm. And um, was it going to be one of those things you were never going to be like your dad, or you were never going to drink like him? You know, I think that um, consciously, I think that all four of us uh, had made that decision that we didn't want to be like him. But uh, as you probably know, you know, our conscious minds are only capable of. Uh, being deployed at anywhere from eight to about 13, 14, 15 percent of the time during the during the day, while the while that god awful subconscious <laughs> controls the rest. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, while we really wanted to not be like our father, uh, in fact, when you th try to think your way through it, that's when you get more and more into hot water, and you actually. Uh, become more and more yeah. like them yeah I, I, and it, so, it sounds uh, like a real a, a real dichotomy there but um in, in fact it, that that uh, i think is the way that it plays out okay you s mark's our guest today by the way uh how many years have you been sober um it'll be coming up on six years now but let me be honest with you there i mean i've had slips during that time okay and um uh, those slips are, uh, you know, uh, uh, in terms of justifying them, there is no good justification for those. It's, um, it's uh, essentially, uh, 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 you know, sl simply slipping into old habits. Yeah. Um, perhaps there's, there's some feeling sorry for yourself. And um, just being sloppy, you know, with, with uh, understanding where you were at and where it is that you're that it's your, you're you're wanting to head for and what your goals are and and just being allowing yourself to to, to be sloppy with your with your lifestyle yeah. then you think that um, you know what I can manage a beer or two you know with my wife and um you know friends that are coming over for a movie or something like that or a barbecue or whatever I can do that this time so uh, that has occurred, uh, you know, five or six different times. Now, let, uh, in in uh, in truth, let me let me just say that uh, uh, when that occurred, I never ever had a drink of alcohol the following day or week or weeks or month. But there have been probably a, a good handful of times that I thought I can do that this during this event. Okay. How did you feel afterwards? I, oh, gee, Lila, <laughs> I had a feeling that was, that question was coming. Uh, the answer is just really like crap. Mm -hmm. First of all, it, it makes you feel ashamed. Yeah. And, and so with, with shame, you can feel depressed. Mm -hmm. But um, physically, and that's the emotional side. In terms of the, the, the physical side, I felt um, uh, scattered in my mm -hmm. thinking. My thinking just felt impaired you know at, even after two or three beers mm -hmm. um so uh, that did not work it'll never work mm -hmm. uh this brain will not work with alcohol on it um because the moment that the alcohol touches this brain i move into an unconscious kind of thought process oh, yeah. all of which is very uh, very um uh, destructive yeah mark is our guest lila and bob are the co-hosts ryan's producing and i'm j michael mccoy and if i haven't told you lately thanks for listening love this job couldn't do it without you we're coming back live here on recovery monday brought to you by the good folks at powell cdc and unity point health a father 
who is headed toward another heart attack. A woman who struggles daily with diabetes and her memory. A boy whose headaches keep him out of school. A mother who one morning discovers a lump. A girl whose condition defies diagnosis. You come to us because you need answers, but you also need more. You need understanding of what you're going through. You need comfort. You need to be treated as an individual, not a condition. You need to be included in your own care. You are the point of everything we do. That's why we're changing to Unity Point Health. It's a model of care that will help us work better together, where the physician who knows you best takes the lead, coordinating your care through every step, from the hospital to specialists, to rehabilitation, to health services in the home and in the community, to making sure the treatments are effective. By working as a team, we surround you with care, helping you manage your health and your conditions, guiding you to making better choices and living a healthier life. The point of unity is you. Unity Point Health. Hey, psst. Let me let you in on a little secret. You ready? Always try to do business with people, not places. Especially if you seek honest Christian business people. And when it comes to my car, I really need to trust who's working on it. Now, my family is so blessed. A few years ago, we found a family-owned automobile repair shop that operates as a Christian business also. Open, honest, reliable, trustworthy. It's Amco on Hickman Road in front of Kmart. And it's a family-owned Christian operating business. This family treats your car as if it was their car. Everything from oil changes to transmission repair and everything in between. So the next time you feel the need to be at peace with your choice of who you can trust with your car, give Amco on Hickman a chance to serve you. And tell them Max sent you. If Tom Coates from Consumer Credit of America was your personal webmaster, Tom would filter out all bad debt emails. If Tom was your mailman, you'd never get any debt reduction junk mail. If Tom Coates was a lineman, he'd block any phone calls offering to reduce your credit card debt. Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America, and we're still your best choice for credit counseling. We're local, we're accountable, and we can do more. You make the call when the time's right for you. When it comes to competition, there really is none for Consumer Credit of America. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Welcome back to this week's program, Recovery Monday, brought to you by the good folks at Powell CDC, a part of Unity Point Health. Lila Stafford, a uh, uh, counselor there, right? Counselor? Yes. Um, uh, drugs and alcohol, mm -hmm. right? And uh, do you deal with body issues at all with the no, clients? Except there, no, no. We don't, but there there are lots of women who have that problem in addition to. And and, and you understand that, so you yeah. can kind of help them out. Uh, uh, I don't understand that. What do you mean, body issues? Um, um, well, you explain. Like weight, you know. Bulimia. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's what I meant. Okay. And uh, uh, Bob Montserrat, you heard him there. Mark is our guest. Ryan's producing today. Now, in the previous segment, we had heard the phrase third stage alcoholic used, and none of us were really clear on what that was. And thanks to Mr. Google, that's right, Mr. Google, Bob Montserrat, the cat in the hat, you have hunted down and have some response for us. That's correct. It's on alcoholic.org.org. Oh, good. There's a whole website for us. Yeah, and it's, it's evidently a scientist that came up with these four phases that studied it extensively. Okay. Uh, stage one is pre-alcoholic uh, that says uh, there's little evidence of problem drinking. Much of the behavior during this phase would look typical to a casual observer. Drinking is primarily social the beginning of this stage. Uh, however, this is a sta as this stage progresses, drinking is used with increasing greater frequency as means for stress reduction. Uh, if I move on to stage two, that's early alcoholic. After you have suffered your first alcohol-related blackout, you are in the early alcoholic stage. This stage is characterized by growing discomfort with drinking combined with an inability to resist it. You may find yourself lying about drinking to friends or loved ones. You might also hide drinks, such as by spiking your soda or coffee when no one else is around. You never did that, right? 
during this stage? No, I no, I didn't. My okay. husband did. Your tolerance of alcohol continues to grow. Well, hey, hold on. I want to stop you there for just a second. I was very... I was either very fortunate or unfortunate. But my alcoholism didn't play out very often. Uh, I'm downstairs. She's upstairs. Kiss me goodnight. By then I hadn't even started yet or maybe one or two in. So my wife was unaware how bad my alcoholism had got. Would you say you hit it from her? Did you purposely no, do it that no, way? No, at all. The bottles were always in the freezer. Oh, okay. Yeah, she just, you know, she didn't ever see the act the actions. Very rarely did she see the actions of a drunk man. Now, my actions as I when I was sober were pitiful because I had the isms, yeah. you know. I was still an alcoholic, and a lot of people listening won't understand that. A true alcoholic, uh, drinking is just a symptom, okay? Um, we act like this, feel like this, think like this, emotions like this all the time but usually it's only when we're consuming alcohol do people put the one and the one together and come up with two mm -hmm. is that fair to yeah. say okay so go ahead stage two with early alcoholic you might also become obsessed with thoughts of alcohol stage three is considered middle alcoholic in the middle alcoholic stage the symptoms of alcoholism usually become obvious to friends and family members you may be, begin missing work or social obligations because of drinking or hangovers you might drink at inappropriate times, such as when caring for your children, driving, or at work, you may al also may become increasingly irritable, arguing with your spouse or friends. Your body will begin to change because of alcohol abuse. You may develop facial redness, stomach bloating, sluggishness, weight gain, or weight loss. In this stage, you might make several attempts to stop drinking and even attend support groups. Support groups, as well as other forms of treatment, can be effective. Okay, s stage four, late alcoholic. During the late alcoholic stage, the effects of long-term alcohol abuse are apparent and serious health problems may develop. Drink becomes an all-day affair, and mm. everything in life, including family and friends, takes a backseat to drinking. If job loss has not already occurred, it frequently happens in this stage. Diseases caused by drinking may develop, such as cirrhosis of the liver or dementia. Paranoid is characteristic of this stage as well. Late-stage alcoholics might also become overly fearful and not be able to explain why. Attempts to stop drinking may be characterized by tremors or hallucinations. Uh, so that is the basically the four stages. So stage four is the worst. That is the worst, and that's the most deadly. Uh, though I would say stage three, if you're drinking and driving and, uh, and so forth, then you're really a, a, a danger to the public. Yeah, right. And yourself, of course. It's in a progressive disease, so it starts out probably stage one and then yeah. progressively gets worse. Right. Okay, now, Mark, you had said that in your family there were five siblings and four of them are alcoholic. That's correct. Can you share for me wh who the—I don't need to know names. Sure. But why is the fifth not one of you? Well, that's a, that's a fascinating question. And um, the, uh, uh, the fifth is um, the only uh, uh, homosexual that we have, gay, uh, and, and he's gay— marvelous uh, uh, brother of mine, uh, brilliant. He's a, uh, a nurse practitioner in, in Orlando. But frankly, he uh, never had a, a, you know, any kind of a predisposition at all to alcohol or the, was never inclined to abuse it. He can have one beer and then be completely done, and that beer would have been a Coors Light, and that's it. And he'll nurse that thing for a couple of hours. Absolutely. But um, so do you... Do you think there's any tie to the fact that he is homosexual to the actions of your mother and father, his mother and father, and how he was raised? Well, yeah, I mean, that, of course, that's a that's a very um, that that's, that's a whole other place other, to go. No, not no, not at all. But I, I, I'm sorry if it is. But I can't say that I'm you know certainly uh, very uh, knowledgeable about it. There are a lot of uh, uh, um, you know a lot of. Uh, uh, views and perspectives, you know, on, on why an individual, yeah. you know, uh, bec uh, uh, is gay and uh, moves uh, in that uh, a sexual orientation uh, type of direction. Uh, I, I can say that uh, my brother Michael, uh, my father was gone during most of the time that he was being raised, so his relationship became highly dependent on his mother. 
Uh, that was not the case while I was growing up. Mm-hmm. My dad was there, then he was gone. There and then gone, there and then gone. And um, so I had, a, I had a physical relationship with him, but nothing emotional. I knew that he was there. When he was there, he was certainly not present. So the, the relationships that us four older siblings had with our father was entirely different than what our youngest had. And you said your mother liked bourbon. Yes, that's correct. Now, you 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 defined your father as a stage three alcoholic. Yeah, I, and I'd have to uh, uh, amend that by saying, uh, you know, after Bob's uh, 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 intervention here, <laughs> that that is a stage four. Clearly, my father was okay. very stage four. And what would your mother have been? Um, she wasn't uh, very. Uh, I don't think that she was at any stage. Frankly, okay. she enjoyed her bourbon. But she could cut it off at two. And frankly, she had to because she was uh, raising uh, all of us kids by herself. Okay. Well, hold on. Cut it off at 2 p.m.? Uh, no, oh, two drinks. Drink. Yeah, oh. Dad, 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 two drinks. Kids are coming home from school. I better get sober. <laughs> That's what I thought you meant. Okay. All right. So, so she gave you a pretty normal life. Yes. Home life. My my hero in my life is my mother. Okay. Without question, she was the rock. She uh, received nothing but uh, hardship and heartache from the man she married and, and the father of her children. So uh, she uh, she worked a full time job and raised five kids on her own. Now you speak as if she's passed. Actually, not. She's eighty eight and still a Spitfire, living in Fort Dodge. Okay. All right. <laughs> And how how long has your father been gone? He died uh, 20 years ago. And she never remarried or anything like that? That's correct. Yeah. Well, I guess it's 68. Would you remarry at 68? Um, depends who, who it was. <laughs> who was? <laughs> good answer. I guess that's a good answer. Sure. I don't. Here's George the deal. Clooney walks in. <laughs> Brad Pitt walks in. I think we already know the answer to that. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the deal. I, I don't have that feeling like if something happened to my husband that I have to be married. Yeah. I, I was never that way growing up either. I mean, I was 32 when I got married. Wow. I'm okay. fine by myself. Okay. All right. Um, sorry, I don't know how it got, got there. I, I just, I'm always fascinated by the family dynamics and, and how our hurts, habits, and hang-ups Okay, whether that be alcohol or food issues or fear or uh, uh, I know some people who um, um, well, I'll give you an idea. I know this one guy and he'll talk about his wife's emotional abuse to him. All right. And when we hear that term emotional abuse, we you know, that's that's bad. That's bad. Mm-hmm. Well, when I finally got got his trust, one of the things that he he felt that she was the most abusive on is when he came in the back door, he wouldn't put his shoes on the shelf and she would complain about that. And he called that emotional abuse. Yeah. So, and to him, I don't think he was, I don't think he was trying to play me or play anybody Mm -hmm. else. His sensitivity level is so high Mm -hmm. that to be nagged on whatever you want to call it day after day after day i mean i i remember once he said to me he said where does it matter where the d-a-m-n shoes are you know Mm -hmm. he he really felt a lot of pressure from that so okay um so um what stage were you when you quit six years ago Mm -hmm. oh that's that's a very very good question I, I would have to say, uh, you know, based on Bob's description here and, um, uh, you know, where, uh, where I felt like I, I was at, it, w- it would, uh, oh, I'd have to put myself at a stage three. Would you? Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. And, and were there any, um, uh, did you pay any consequences in your life for that level of drinking? I really did. That's, uh, that's an important uh, question to answer. I think that once you're at a, at that uh, level of a dependency, you know, with any kind of an addiction that's going to play out in in real uh, destructive ways, the uh, it began to have some very negative uh, implications in the in the relationship with my wife, uh, because uh, as uh, we all know, uh, 
in the in the uh, alcohol world that uh, we we withdraw from relationships we withdraw we we are afraid of uh, relationships afraid of affection and love and we don't feel like we're necessarily uh, worthy so it don't played, f- we don't feel like we're lovable don't feel like we're lovable i, I would say that's even that's a, the, i'm not saying a, that for you a, that was my case I, I would say that's a better took, description yeah it took a few years of uh, psychological counseling but that's really you know that's very vulnerable for somebody to say that but that's right. what it is I, I didn't feel lovable exactly and which really is if I may continue for just a second. I'm yeah. sorry, Mark. No, that's the that's really how I thought of myself. Yeah. Okay, what you did or didn't do to make me feel that way was really born and seeded within myself. I had uh, an ego the size of Manhattan and self confidence the size of an aspirin. That's correct, and I think anybody who uh, is really looking to escape uh, into their own selves. Um, they're they're all people that that, that struggle with uh, with with ego issues. Ego being that false identity that we create uh, that uh, helps us build that shell around our uh, away from our authentic self because we're simply afraid to to um, show uh, uh, to reveal to, to to reveal ourselves yeah. to ourselves and and everybody else. Yeah, there, there's a, a thing in counseling. It's called Jacory's box. You ever heard of that? Yeah. Corey's box. And it's a box with four, four, four panes, like a window. And one of them is called the blind spot. And it's the stuff that only when you're immensely comfortable to the point where you can become vulnerable with somebody, do you even see the stuff that's in the blind spots. All right, we're coming up on a break. We're coming back. Mark's our guest. Lila and Bob are here. I'm Mac. And we'll be back in three minutes right here live on Recovery Monday. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. I'm Brian Leach, owner and general manager of Service Legends. I brought a long couple of the uh, home comfort heroes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tammy Wells. I am Nick Wondershot. I'm administrative manager. I'm the senior technician. I'm Service Legends. It seems like every good thing, when you feel it to the bone that it's good, there's a lot of hard work put behind it. You just, I, I don't think that you can fake it and have it turn out good. You know, if we seem like, okay, that's just weird, it's just a furnace, why would you believe so deeply in a furnace? It's not just that, you know, we want to show the world that you can have good service. Yeah, I mean, it's gotta be, it's your home. You know, it's, it's built into our daily trainings, it's built into our culture, um, that we're gonna do whatever it takes to have each client say they love us, period. That's why we spend all the hours in the training that we do, and if we guarantee it's gonna be a good experience for you, or else it's free. What type of work do you think we're going to do? <laughs> there is a guarantee. Temperature selection guarantee, fixed rider it's free guarantee, comfort guarantee, best value guarantee. All of these guarantees hold us accountable to ensuring that we exceed your expectations. And if for whatever reason we'd fail and we can't make it right, we guarantee all of those guarantees with a 100% money back guarantee. I mean, if you don't think that your technician can fix it right, are you going to say that to a client? No. <laughs> You don't have to worry about having a technician come to your house. We drug test, background check all of our team members. We put safe people in your home. Each and every one of our service techs, 400 hours a year in training. You tell it the minute they walk in the door. They know what they're doing, they've done their homework, and they actually truly care about what you want. Because at the end of the day, you're the person that makes sure I have a job. They're gonna be listening. They're gonna wanna know what your challenges are. Then they're gonna come and give you options and, and you get to choose. If I'm there to help and I make it easy and painless, I did my job right that day. Well, when it comes to your comfort, safety, and your family. You know, you don't necessarily go buy the most expensive, but you get the most bang for your buck. Oh, it's worth it because there's a lot of people that will find a way to get it to work right now and then leave and then come back, charge you again. And and the cycle just repeats itself. So when I'm out there looking at the furnace, I want to find why it failed the day. How can we change the part today with something that you're not going to have to worry about? Is it worth changing the part today? I mean, you can put a lot of money into a furnace. I can fix parts all day. There's good job security in that for me. But is it the right thing for you? I get a lot of the phone calls of after the technicians are there. They're just in awe. They're like, wow, you guys are great. I mean, I don't even know what to say. You guys are great. Everything you did is perfect. It's great. (laughs) Keep going, though. I like this. (laughs) Just give us a try. I'm going to take all the risk. I've got the time to make this right. I've got the support to make it right. Just check us out. And if you don't see the value in what we do. I mean, fixed writer, it's free or 100% money back. Enough said.
22 minutes before the top of the hour on this fourth day of August in the Lord's year 2014. I'm J. Michael McCoy, and this is Recovery Monday, brought to you by the good people, the wonderful people, the caring people, the loving people at Powell CDC. You know, I, I say this every show, and, and I just need you to understand that this is true. When there's somebody, <clears throat> excuse me, in our lives that we care very much about, it could be your child, it could be your spouse, it could be a sibling, it could be a neighbor, could be your pastor, could be somebody else at church, that you sense there's this issue of drug or alcohol dependence. Maybe you don't have to sense it. Maybe it's been discussed out loud, but there's so much shame, so much shame that comes with the inability to control what we do in our lives. Now, if you think about that, that's pretty amazing to think about it because we can't control anything. And the only reason you don't help that person out is because you don't know anybody. You don't want to call 911. You don't want to call a phone number because you think they're going to come out in little white coats and strap them in the back of a bus and take them off. That won't happen. You now have three people sitting in this studio. Well, I won't include Bob because you don't volunteer for that. But uh, Lila, you can call Lila and you can call me at any time. And when you say, hey, I, I was listening to that show with Mark the other day, and, and I don't know, something reminded me of a friend. We already know what you're saying. You don't have to go any farther than right there. And we'll sit down and we'll help, and we'll only allow the help that you allow. That's all we'll do. Don't think we're going to come stampeding through your life and embarrassing you because we did something that embarrassed your friend or sibling or spouse or pastor or whatever. But you have to own this. You know somebody. You know somebody. Okay? Mark is our guest. Mark, um, let's go back. Um, let's go back. Uh, well, you were starting to tell me how things, uh, how, how your drinking cost you things. It was costing you the relationship with your wife. Uh, are you still married to that woman? Yes, I am, thankfully. Okay. How about some of your children? Uh, I would have to say all of them, uh, all of the children, because, uh, you know, you don't just become uh, uh, disenchanted and disenfranchised with one person and not the others and still maintain a, a very healthy relationship with others that just simply doesn't, it doesn't play out that way. An addiction uh, 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 issue doesn't play out that way. So uh, w without a doubt, and what really disturbed me was with our, our, our youngest, uh, who at this stage here was only 12. She is my only child, biological child. The other two I call my own because I help raise them from ages five and six. They're now well into their, their late 20s. But I, I, uh, I couldn't stand to uh, and fathom the thought that my little baby girl would see her father with a drink in his hand, talking stupid and acting irresponsible. And that played uh, a, a big role in my uh, decision that uh, it was time. In addition to that, I felt like uh, I was getting to a point in my business to where I was, uh, where things were dropping, dropping the ball on developing my people, my leaders. Uh, the, uh, the organization was not as profitable as what I had promised them that we, we would be doing. I had promised them that we would be uh, much further along with uh, certain product development uh, issues. Those, those balls were getting dropped. And, and you were dropping them. And I was the guy dropping them. Okay. Um, and you knew it. And I knew it. That's good. But I'll tell you, there was one event, you know, uh, in October of uh, 2008 that really made it very clear to me that I had to have some help. And that was when my mother-in-law uh -oh. was in the, our backyard and uh, so, uh, sitting on the deck. And she was sitting with my wife. And my wife was almost in tears because she said that uh, she was t sharing with her mother that I was a... Uh, I, I was, uh, uh, an asshole. And um, so my mother-in-law became quite direct with me. Yeah, Mother Bear. Mother Bear. She's going she's gonna to protect her cubs. And I became defensive. 
And my mother-in-law, who is a pretty savvy, wise lady herself, could tell the, the, uh, the way to disarm that was to share some love. And she said, Mark, I love you. And that's all it took. Mm. That's all it took. I went into tears. And then I knew that I had no control over this any longer and that I needed help. And that was on a Saturday at about 6 o'clock at night. That Monday, I went to Powell. Mm. And I was there for not long. I should have stayed longer uh, because it would have been a great learning experience. But um, I uh, when, uh, uh, enrolled in the evening class from 5 until 9 o'clock at night and felt that it was a tremendous experience. But I stayed essentially one week. Then after that... Um, I quickly got into uh, AA and met a, met a number of folks. 12-step programs. Into 12-step into programs, that's yeah. correct. And that was six years ago. That was six years, coming up on six years ago. That's okay. correct. Um, it, we're going to take another break here in a few minutes. When we come back, I want to talk about you know how different your life is. But, but the way you speak of your, uh, that experience with your mother-in-law, that was life-changing. It absolutely was, Mac. Yet, uh, it, 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 essentially, she gave me the green light that it was okay for me to be vulnerable. Yeah. Because had she continued to be forceful with me, then that was an energy that I could deal with yep. because I could put my dukes back up. I learned how to fight my whole life is the only way, uh, which is the only way that I knew how to handle people was that a, the, the, the best uh, defense was a very strong offense. And, um, but when she became, when she allowed me to be vulnerable, it's when I, when I fell apart. Yeah. And now I want to, I want to come over to you, Lila, because uh, I think that's one of the most powerful lessons that anybody listening to this program can hear right now. As much as you want to come out with guns blazing, to your son-in-law, daughter-in-law, spouse, whoever that is, what an alcoholic needs when he's at that point is the vulnerability to say, well, my name is Mac and I'm an alcoholic and I do need help. Right? Yeah. And I, I have this um, sentence that I, I actually have it um, on some cards that I give our clients to teach them how to talk to people when you're really mad. And it's what it is essentially is when you're mad at someone, you want them to know how they made you feel. Mm -hmm. So instead of yelling at them, which your mother-in-law may have wanted to do, you know, because you're angry. But what that does is it puts up walls for everybody. And all you're doing is you never solve a problem. You're just going back and forth to see who's the smartest as, as far as arguing but the real problem's underneath that. Mm -hmm. So this sentence is, you, you say the person's name, and then you say, when you said, or when you did, and you just, in really short sentence, you name what they did or what they said, and you say, what I made up about that, because it's, it's my reality. When I, when I heard you say this, this is what I made up about it, and it made me feel, and you put a you know, mad, sad, glad, or scared, and th that's it. And then that person knows how their actions made you feel, and then all of a sudden, you're, you have to be vulnerable to say it and to hear it. And it's amazing how, how much can be done yeah. by just that simple sentence. But people want to add on to the sentence. It's, it's, it's short and concise, but it's your heart's talking to each other. Yeah, and, and we have a saying in the 12-step programs that hurt people hurt people. And when two people are in an argument like that, the goal is not to hurt the other one, but that becomes the M.O. I'm going to give you an example. When I was in treatment, do we have time? No. Okay. I need you to come back okay. and because and, I want to give you time. We've only got about yeah. 30 seconds till the break. But if you've never heard that phrase before, hear it for the first time. Hurt people hurt people. So when you've got somebody who's destructive in your life, a family member, someone you care about, chances are they're not crazy or unreasonable. Chances are they're broken, they're hurt, and hurt people hurt people. When we come back, Lila's experience, what, Mark, uh, what Mark's life is like now, coming up on KTIA Iowa. 
you've experienced God's power, and you've heard the sermons telling you to reach the lost by demonstrating the kingdom of God on the streets. But has anyone ever helped you do it? The Kingdom Power Immersion Camp. It's time for action. If you need help, we'll show you how. Get hands-on training from experienced coaches as we bring the kingdom of God to the Iowa State Fair. We'll work together and help you walk in God's power. Get equipped for a kingdom of God lifestyle as you touch thousands with God's love and power. Heal the sick, prophesy, and walk in dominion. You'll never be the same again. Let Dave and Patty Lock of Holy Spirit-led ministries and Andy Hayner of Full Speed Impact and a team of John G. Lake ministry directors work with you for a lifestyle of walking in God's power. The Kingdom Power Immersion Camp. August 6th to 17th. Come for all of it or part of it. Don't miss the special student camp August 10th to 17th. Go to fullspeedimpact.com or hslm.us for more information. Get away from us, you mean old credit card. We don't have any more money. We're in trouble now. Save us! Help! Somebody save us! Somebody help! Help! Save us! Hi, I'm Tom Coach from Consumer Credit of Des Moines. If your credit card's a little too animated, give us a call. Hooray! We're saved! Super Credit! You're our hero! From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. All right, we're back, and uh, it is Recovery Monday, and we were just getting ready to hear Lila tell a story about, you said, back when you were in treatment? Yes, and um, we, if you go to treatment, you have um, these groups once a day. They meet for an hour, and you just discuss problems. I don't know what you do, but anyway, you just talk. So there's a guy in our group that hogged everybody's time every single day, and it, anyway, we wanted him to be quiet, and I thought, I'm just going to say something mean to him to make him be quiet so we can get on with with um, what we really wanted to talk about. So, um, and I took it upon myself to do this. So I yelled something really mean to him. He stopped. And we were required to talk to each other with the sentence that I was just talking about. So afterwards, he came up to me just by himself. And he said, Lila, when you said, da 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 whatever I said, I can't remember. What I made up about that was is that you don't like men. And it made me feel really sad. And I'll tell you, I just, I about died. Because first of all, I didn't know that I didn't like men at the time, but I, in my family system, all the men are right and the women aren't. And so it, I unconsciously, when I got out from under that system, I was always trying to prove myself right with men. And, you know, I'm right, you're wrong. And if that guy hadn't confronted me in that way, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have ever known that about myself. It mm -hmm. would have stayed in that subconscious what we were talking about. Plus, I didn't know that men had feelings because I'd never seen that in my family system. Mm -hmm. So that guy, by talking in that way, taught me two huge things in my life um, that I wouldn't have. If he'd come up to me and called me names and said, don't you ever talk to me like that again, I would have been yelling at him and would have been a fight to see who won. Right. And, and I wouldn't have ever been blessed with the opportunity to learn something about myself. Isn't that cool how yeah. that works? That's incredible. Yeah, and I, I just want to go back, and if you're just joining us, wow. what we're talking about is that, that, that you know, when, when, when hurt people are hurt, they hurt other people. Hurt people hurt people. And so many times you get into a conversation, and, and the other person's just being unreasonable. It just doesn't make sense. And they keep pushing that button. They keep poking that finger in that scab of yours. And it's like, you don't, don't go there. That's so unfair. Well, we are hurt so bad by the world. Probably not even by this person. In fact, this person might be a safe person. That's why we treat them that way, because we know they'll still love us. Don't talk to other people like that. Don't try to one-up them, because that's what you really yeah. do. Oh, you think I'm hurt? Here, I'll show you how I can really yeah. hurt you. Oh, that doesn't hurt me, but here, I'm going to hurt you back. Well, the goal is you want the other person to know how what they did hurt you. Right. How it affected you. So, you know, just fr from a child, we know how to make, you know, we yell and scream yeah. and win a fight. But as adults, there are other ways of doing it. Did you ever thank him? No. 
Do you remember and his I name? No. Don't say it. No. no. It, it, I went in Arizona anyway. I, I have no clue who he is. Okay. All right, Mark. So uh, on uh, in October of 2008, your mother-in-law, through love, reached out to you and said that she loved you. And that triggered something inside of you that knew you needed to go to Powell. That's correct. You went to Powell. You got sober. Tell me how your life at work and with your wife and with your mother-in-law and with your daughter, uh, t tell me how all that has just blossomed now that you have become a successful <laughs> member of not only society but a 12-step program. Yeah, absolutely, Mac. Um, it, uh, opened the, it opened the door, first of all, to uh, allowing myself to be vulnerable with my family, which was the most important benefit that I that I received and I began to feel that almost immediately um, while all the uh, layers of the onion were certainly not peeled back it really helped with the process so that was the that was where I needed to begin and in doing so and showing empathy and sympathy to my wife and children I began to feel more human as a result of that, my self-worth began to rise. I began to feel better about myself so that I could stand in front of my team at work and become the leader that they had expected out of me. So you, you were honest with them about I, your drinking. I was honest with them. I brought everybody together in a company meeting, and I told them that I had an addiction to alcohol and that uh, from here on out, you're going to see a man who has changed, who is uh, not going to drop the ball on promises that we have made as an organization, and that we're going to follow through with our growth plans. So stay put. Things are going to get exciting. I'll never forget when I brought my company together to tell them that I was sober, some girl, and I don't know who it was, when I said, I, I ha I ha I'm an alcoholic, I'm addicted to alcohol, and she said, no kidding. Oh. Yeah, everybody else knew it except yeah. me. But go anyway, go ahead. Then from there, you know, um, things began to gel. But, you know, th th that was, uh, that was uh, the, the uh, right at the beginning stage still of the Great Recession. So things were very difficult in the, uh, in the HR recruitment and uh, software world. Uh, things uh, technologically were evolving like crazy. Companies were pushing back on doing anything regarding uh, electronic recruitment solutions and uh, applicant tracking systems because it wasn't uh, it wasn't top of mind. It wasn't it wasn't a real core uh, solution that they needed in order to stay healthy. So we had to re-engineer, re and um, uh, it, it uh, also meant that uh, uh, I needed to downsize. Uh, from 28 full-time people down to uh, 17. Mm. And, um, but I kept my promise by the end of um, 2009, ended up flat uh, in terms of profitability, but we did not experience a loss. And I think that that's when I gained, regained my current employees' um, confidence that I am serious about the viability of our organization. And you're serious about your sobriety. Serious about my sobriety. They could tell that I was much more lucid, involved, focused, and uh, engaged. Clearly engaged uh, was uh, one, of the, one of the largest um, uh, symptoms of... Uh, of you must have really involved. known that you were, that you were going to stay sober because I don't think people announce it especially to their company, unless they know deep inside that they're, they're really going to give it their all. Good, good, good to comment, uh, Lila. I think that um, uh, uh, the answer to that is yes. And, um, but I also believe that uh, part of that was selfish in knowing that if I told them and I get put myself out there, I was then uh, needing to, to be accountable. Yeah, I had to hold myself accountable; otherwise, I could sneak behind the curtain. Yeah, and that's healthy. I don't. I I love it when people do that. I, I would call it healthy. That was uh, one of the most difficult things I've ever done in my life, if not the most difficult. Mm -hmm. 
then uh, from there we uh, sought um, sought out a uh, professional investor in a, in a private equity company who saw the potential in our business, and uh, they uh, made a sizable investment in the organization, that, which took uh, seven or seven or eight months to uh, move through. And uh, from there, the the rest is history. We really took off like a rocket. I moved our uh, a technology to an entirely more sophisticated software platform, software as a service, and that's, that means cloud-based yeah. uh, uh, technology model. And congratulations, the rest, the rest was great. Congratulations on your success and everything that you've done. We appreciate it. Uh, Mark's been our guest here on Recovery Monday. We'll see you next week when the folks from Powell CDC will introduce you to somebody else's life who has been changed. <laughs>